Today's video is entitled RC Parallel Circuits. It's the first video I'm making in a series for RLC Parallel Circuits. I previously made a video for an explanation, going through an explanation for RC Parallel Circuits. This one, we're going to do an example problem. I've also made a bunch of videos for our LC series circuit. You can link to those in the upper right hand corner. Before we go on, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Please subscribe, step by step science, get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. You can click on the notifications bell, you can share, you can like, and please leave me a comment. I'd always want to know what you think of the videos. This is an example problem for RC parallel circuits with an alternating voltage source, which we're going to have here as 230 volts. The frequency of that source is 55 hertz. The resistance of the resistor is 150 ohms. And the capacitance of the capacitor is here 15 microfarads. All right, now in this video, we're going to go through and do all of the following and maybe even a little more. We're going to determine the capacitive reactance. We're going to get the current through each branch. We're going to draw the current phasor diagram and get the phase angle and the total current. We're going to get the impedance and we're going to use our admittance triangle and get the admittance and the phase angle that way. Also, let's get started by doing first the, or determining first the capacitive reactance. So we need to do this for our capacitor, basically get the resistance of the capacitor in an alternating voltage. And we're going to use uh, this equation, which says Xc. X is for capaci uh, capacitive reactance for the reactance Xc. And it's 1 over 2 pi times the frequency times the capacitance of the capacitor, which is then going to be 1 over 2 times pi times 55 times 10 to the minus 6. Don't forget microfarads. You have to convert this into farads, and that would be 10 to the minus 6 is microfarads. And if we do that, we get that the resistance, or the capacitive reactance, the resistance of that capacitor is 193 ohms. Okay, now we know the resistance of the resistor, we know the resistance of the capacitor, and now we can get the current through each branch. Now for the current through each branch, we're simply going to use Ohm's law of equals I times R, solve that for I, we get the current is equal to the voltage of the source divided by the resistance of the resistor, same thing for the capacitor, and you will remember that we have a parallel circuit, and when we have parallel circuits, the voltage across each branch is going to be equal to each other and also to the voltage of the source, which is different, you remember, from series circuits where the voltages are different and the currents are the same. So we have a 230 volt source, so it's 230 divided by 150 gives us a current through the resistor as 1.53, and for the capacitor that's 230 divided by 193, which we got from the previous page, and that turns out to be 1. 0.19 amperes. Now remember, we have an alternating source, so this is going to be changing over time. The current's going to change over time, and these are the maximum currents, whether it's the maximum or the RMS voltage that you use, you'll be getting the maximum or the RMS voltage, but of course, they're changing, they're varying over time. Now, we can now get the total current using our current phasor diagram, and you will remember that we're going to put the voltage on the x-axis, that's kind of a reference because the voltage is the same across each of the branches. And you will remember for a circuit with a resistor that the voltage and the current through the resistor are in phase. There's no phase angle, so we draw that right like that along the x-axis also. And you will also remember that for a alternating source, the current is going to lead the voltage by 90 degrees, ICE, as in LE, the Iceman. There's a 90 degree angle between the voltage and the current through the capacitor. And therefore, we draw that along the positive y-axis. Now, we want to find out the sum of those two voltages, excuse me, the sum of those two currents. And we have to add them up vectorally so we can move this vector over that way. And you can see we have a nice right triangle. And the hypotenuse of that right triangle represents the total current through the circuit as it changes over time. Now, we can use our uh, trig functions, okay? Uh, sine, cosine, no, excuse me, not the trig function. We can use the Pythagorean theorem here to get the total current, which is the length of that hypotenuse, and that's a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and that is that the c squared, or c is the hypotenuse, so we can solve that for the total current, Pythagorean theorem, and we get that the total current is equal to the square root of the current through the resistor squared plus the current through the capacitor squared, and then we can just plug the values in and we get that the total current 
through that circuit, the maximum total current is 1.94 amperes. Okay, so that's the current. And the next thing we're going to do is we get the phase angle. The phase angle is the angle between the total current and the voltage. And we're going to do that right here on this slide. Now, as I mentioned before, we're going to use our trig functions, sine, cosine, and tangent. We know now the length of all three sides of our right triangle. We could use any trig function that we like, sine, cosine, or tangent. And usually you see people using the tangent. So we're going to do that. The tangent is obviously the opposite over the adjacent, right? So katoa, and that means the opposite to this side, the opposite from this angle is the current through the capacitor. The adjacent is the current through the resistor, opposite over adjacent. Plug those values in, and then you get that it's 1.19 amperes divided by 1.53 amperes, and you get that the phase angle is 38 degrees, and that's the angle between the voltage and the current. The current leads the voltage by 38 degrees in this circuit. Okay, so there we go. That is now. Okay, now that we have phase the phase angle, angle, we are going to, on the next slide, go through and determine the total impedance of the circuit. And we're going to do that two different ways. A lot of times there's a couple of different ways you can do these problems, and you can do this to check your math and make sure you're doing uh, correctly. You get the same answer for both ways. You should be doing something correctly. And in this case, the impedance. For a parallel circuit, it's going to be 1 over the square root of 1 over r squared plus 1 over xc squared. We already know r, we already know xc, so we can simply just plug those values in. That would be 1 over the square root of 1 over 50 squared, 150 squared, plus 1 over 193 ohms squared. And you get that the impedance for that circuit is 118 ohms. Remember, the impedance is the sum of all the resistances, the resistances and the reactances. Okay, so now we can also do this using Ohm's law, and we should be able to get the same answer. So Ohm's law is V equals I times R. For an alternating current, we have V equals I times Z, Z being the impedance, the sum of all the resistances. And therefore, we can solve that equation for Z. Z equals the voltage of the source divided by the total current. And if you do that, 230 divided by 194 0.94, of course, is going to give you the same impedance of 118 ohms. Now, we have the same answer, so we have some confidence that we've done some of these other things that we did previously um, the same, okay, or done them correctly. Now, we know the currents, we know the impedance, and now we're going to go through and use our admittance triangle and determine the admittance and the phase angle that way also. Now, I just want to point out, remember, admittance is used for parallel circuits because it talks about like how much current is admitted through the circuit, which when you add elements in parallel, you're going to be admitting, you're going to be increasing the current, you're going to be admitting more current. Now for parallel and series circuits, there's kind of corresponding terms for admittance. You remember we have impedance, and then also for <clears throat> series circuits, we have resistance and we have capacitive reactance. Well, when we have Parallel circuits, we don't talk so much about resistance. We can also talk about the conductance, like how much current does the circuit conduct? And that's kind of corresponding uh, analogous term for our resistance. And then for capacitive reactance, we use the capacitive susceptance. It talks about like how susceptible is the capacitor to changes in voltage. Now we can calculate the conductance and the capacitive susceptance pretty easily because it's just G is equal to one over R. G being the symbol for the conductance and for the capacitive susceptance, it's just one over the capacitive reactance. All right, and we can just plug the values in and we get 6.67 times 10 to the minus three S. S is for Siemens, that's the units for the admittance, the conductance, and the capacitive, and also the inductive susceptance. All right, and this is going to be 1 over 193, which is 5.18 times 10 to the minus 3 Siemens. We have those values, and now we can use those values to build our triangle for our admittance and also determine the phase angle. Once again, we're going to put the voltage on the x-axis, and we're going to put the conductance, because that's going to, again, be in phase with the voltage. And then we can put the capacitive susceptance on the positive um, y-axis, just like we did for our current. And we can move that vector over, add these up vectorially again, and you get that the triangle, right triangle, and the hypotenuse for that triangle is going to be 
representing our admittance in this case. So once again, we have the phase angle, and once again, we have the Pythagorean theorem to find the uh, length of the hypotenuse of that triangle, which is six point of the square root of 6.67 times 10 to the minus 3 semen squared plus 5.18 times 10 to the minus 3 semen squared. If you do that, then you get that the admittance of that circuit is going to be 8.45 times 10 to the minus 3 semen. And if you add uh, more, if you were to add more parallel elements to that circuit, then the admittance would be increasing. All right, now we have all of that stuff that we've done, and we're gonna get the phase angle again, and we should get the same phase angle, 38 degrees, which is the tangent again, is gonna be the opposite over the adjacent, which is going to be, the tangent is 5.18 times 10 to the minus three Siemens, divided by 6.67 times 10 to the minus three Siemens, and we get that that phase angle is 38 degrees, okay? So once again, we did that, and we got the same phase angle, so that gives us, uh, I would say, a high degree of confidence that we did the previous things for this circuit uh, correctly, calculated those correctly. All right, now, we're gonna go through and do one other thing really quick. We're gonna also determine the current using the admittance, okay? Once again, we should get the same current. I think we had 1.94. Remember that we have Ohm's law, V equals I times R, and we have V equals I times Z for an alternating current, and we're gonna solve for the total current, okay? And this is, says here that the total current should be equal to the voltage divided by the um, impedance, but you remember you can also calculate the admittance as the admittance is just the reciprocal of, or the inverse of one of the uh, impedance, which is one over Z, and if you do that, you'll notice you have one over Z in this equation also, so we can substitute Y, the impedance, into this equation for the total current. And then you'll notice that you get that the total current is equal to the voltage of the source times the admittance. 230 times the admittance, which we calculated earlier, and you get that the total current, once again, is 100, 100, 1.94 amperes. All right, and if you wanted to check, um, the admittance, we had the impedance, which we calculated earlier, so we could just put in here 1 divided by 118. If you do 1 divided by 118, then you'll get this value also. So it's nice when you do that more than one way, and then you can see how all those things fit together and kind of the relationships between those values for that parallel RC circuit. All right, so there you go. We did everything we wanted to do for that video. I think we figured everything out. I think it went well, everything step by step. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found that video helpful. If you did, please do all of the following four things. Subscribe to my channel. Get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos, step-by-step -step science. You should give me a thumbs up. You should leave me a comment, please, once again. And don't forget, sharing is caring. Share this video with all of your friends and show them just how much you care. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in the next video. Hmm. <sighs>